The History of Poland Podcast, Episode 19, Raring for a Fight. Hello and welcome back. Let's get everybody back up to speed. We left off with the half-brothers Bolesław and Zbigniew firm in a civil war. Both had inherited roughly half of their father Władysław's lands, but neither was really content with the status quo. After years of friction, intrigue, and general shenanigans, the two opposing camps met on the field of battle. When the fog of war had cleared, Bolesław had the upper hand, and, after a brief chase scene that should probably belong in a movie somewhere, Zbigniew was forced to capitulate and swear fealty to his half-brother. Zbigniew retained control over the area of Mazovia, but as a servant of Bolesław's, not in his own right. This could have been the beginning of an era of peace and stability. Imagine it. Poland. United under the benevolent rule of two brothers, both putting the interests of the people above their own vanity and ego. What could have been? It was not to be, though. No, this peace was not to last for very long at all. After all, this is Poland in the 12th century. Things don't calm down for more than a couple weeks at a time. Before we jump into what happens next, let's recap a few key pieces of information. First, Bolesław has for many years now been trying to conquer Pomerania. Access to the sea would have been a major economic boon for Bolesław and quite the feather in the cup of his reign. Yet, despite his desire to conquer these lands, he was stymied at every turn by his half-brother Zbigniew. Maybe that will change now that Zbigniew is out of the way. Maybe Zbigniew will even help as his oath of fealty demands. Second, Bolesław had a few stable alliances. The primary one was with King Koloman of Hungary. Bolesław called on this alliance when fighting against Zbigniew. In exchange, Koloman had the right to call upon Bolesław in the event he was endangered. This may come in handy for Koloman in the near future. That's called foreshadowing. Third and finally, Zbigniew had a decent enough relationship with both the Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and the Bohemian rulers. These hadn't proved useful in the battles with his half-brother, but the ties were still there. This is also called foreshadowing. These loosely related facts are the basis of what's about to happen in a very short period of time. It starts, like so many things in the history of Poland, with an attempted invasion of Pomerania. One last bit of background that I don't think I've mentioned in the past. Pomerania is continuously described as a swamp area, which is a big part of why it has been so difficult for Bolesław and other leaders to conquer it, retain control after defeating their enemies, or for Pomerania to be fully Christianized. Anyway, as Gallus tells us about this invasion of Pomerania, quote, It was winter when the Poles gathered again to invade Pomerania for they could more easily seize the strongholds once the marshes had frozen. Then again, Bolesław discovered Zbigniew's treachery, when it was revealed openly that he had broken his oath in all matters he had sworn to. End quote. So, Zbigniew may have sworn fealty to Bolesław, but that apparently didn't really mean much. Bolesław had expected Zbigniew to tear down one of his castles, and also to come help Bolesław if called upon. Zbigniew did neither. While Bolesław could have gotten riled up by this and gone to attack Zbigniew immediately, he chose to temporarily ignore the slight and continue on into Pomerania with the forces he did have. Gallus continues on, telling us that, quote, Like a fire-breathing dragon that burns down everything nearby by its breath alone and demolishes what is not burnt with the sweep of its tail and flies across the lands bringing destruction, so Bolesław threw himself against Pomerania, destroying the rebels with the sword and their strongholds with fire. But let us pass over what he did as he crossed and recrossed their land, and proceed to the siege of Alba, a city in the middle of the land. When Bolesław reached the city, held to be the very center of the land, he pitched camp and made ready siege engines, in order to capture the city the more easily and with the less danger. When they were ready, he plied arms and engines without cease, so that in a few days he forced the townsmen to surrender the city. Having received it, he installed his troops there. He then raised his banners, struck camp, and set off towards the coast. End quote. Bolesław has taken the city of Alba, which was about 30 kilometers away from the coastline. From there, Gallus tells us that he headed off to the city of Kołobrzeg, which is on the coast. After this 30-kilometer trek, Bolesław apparently contemplated storming the fortress by the sea, when, quote, the citizens and their townsmen came out to meet him with necks bowed, surrendering their persons and vowing their loyalty and service. And the Duke of the Pomeranians himself came to Bolesław and bowed before him, and pledged to serve and fight for him who sat on horseback. End quote. Following this, Gallus tells us that, quote, For five weeks Bolesław rode through Pomerania, expecting or seeking battle, and brought almost the whole of the kingdom under his sway without a fight. 
with such titles of glory as Boleslav to be praised, with such triumphs of war and victories to be crowned, end quote. So, Boleslav is wreaking havoc in Pomerania without the help of his brother. If you're thinking that Boleslav is going to turn the other cheek and just let Zbigniew get away with failing to live up to his obligations, well, you just don't know Boleslav. Again, Gallus tells us that, quote, So Boleslav, on seeing that his brother had shown himself faithless in every promise and every oath, and since he set himself ever against the whole land, harmful and liable to harm, he banished him from the entire realm of Poland. By Zbigniew. Gallus continues on, saying, When resistance was offered by the defenders of a castle on the borders of the country, he seized the castle with the help of the Ruthenians and the Hungarians. Thus was brought to end the lordship of Zbigniew's evil counselors, and the whole realm of Poland was united under Boleslav's lordship. And whereas for many to achieve this much in the winter session would have been labor enough, Boleslav thought nothing too arduous where he knew the profit or the honor of his kingdom was being increased. End quote. With Zbigniew gone, Boleslav was essentially given free reign in Pomerania. As Mantefel's book, The Formation of a Polish State, tells it, quote, Zbigniew's expulsion permitted Boleslav to undertake a systematic expansion toward the sea, a movement which up until this time had been repeatedly interrupted because of domestic problems. Boleslav still required a stronger military force to conduct his campaign and to secure bases of operation on the Notek and Vistula, he could then concentrate his attack on both central Pomerania and the area of the Vistula Basin. A campaign was launched against the cities, which defended the access routes through the swamps of the Nocek area, and pitched battles were fought with fluctuating success. The Pomeranians penetrated deep into Boleslav's territory several times, and during one such incursion nearly captured Archbishop Martin. Boleslav retaliated in kind. With Mazovia under his control, he broadened his plan of annexing the coastal area by expanding his attack to include the lands inhabited by the Prussians, whom he first attacked in winter of 1107. End quote. Most of Boleslav's problems are solved, right? First, Zbigniew has been expelled. Second, Boleslav is now master of Pomerania. Third, he has some stable alliances in case he finds himself in trouble. A great combination. Eh, not quite. First, Zbigniew wasn't just going to roll over and let Boleslav keep Poland without resistance. Sure, he was expelled, but as I mentioned in the beginning of this episode, he had allies in both the Empire and Bohemia. Second, the Pomeranians would have strongly disagreed with the idea of Boleslav being master of Pomerania. Yeah, they'd, they'd lost it in battle a handful of times, but they weren't just going to give up the fight. Third, those alliances that Boleslav had relied on in the past were now going to be flipped around, with his allies now relying on him to help solve their problems. As I mentioned in the beginning of this episode, Boleslav had a mutual protection treaty with Kalaman of Hungary. This treaty came into effect when Emperor Henry V launched an invasion of Hungary in 1108 in an effort to bring imperial might to bear on behalf of one of Kalaman's rivals. The invasion had Henry's army facing off against Kalaman's, with Henry's ally Svatopolk also invading Hungary. This two-pronged assault was to be met by a two-pronged defense. Kalaman would face Henry, while Boleslav was tasked with drawing off Svatopolk. As such, Boleslav invaded Bohemia, hoping that it would force Svatopolk to retreat from Hungary and defend his home territory. As Gallus recounts it, quote, When the emperor marched into Hungary, Boleslav kept his word, and beginning with a battle in the middle of the forest, mounted a victorious campaign against Bohemia, where in the course of three days and nights he burnt and laid waste three Castellanis and a suburb. End quote. While this did force an early end to Henry's invasion of Hungary, it also enabled the Pomeranians to seize the initiative, which they did. After all, with Boleslav in the distant south, it would be the perfect time to seize back the fortresses they lost. As Mantefel tells us, quote, The Pomeranians exploited the opportunity, and, aided by an act of treason, took the city of Usch. Boleslav rushed back to retaliate. This retaliation was swift. As Gallus tells us, quote, Boleslav gave his horses and his men some little time to rest, and after again making his forces ready for war, he prepared to march back into Pomerania. As he entered the territory of the enemy, he did not go after plunder or cattle, but laid siege to the castle of Vielen, making ready engines and devices of different kinds. In response, the townsmen, fearing for their lives and placing their hopes in arms alone, speedily raised battlements, repaired damaged ones, hauled up sharpened stakes and stones, and barricaded the gates, 
Once the machines were ready and everyone armed, the Poles attacked the castle valiantly from all sides, while the Pomeranians defended it with no less vigor. The Poles pressed on so strongly from a sense of justice and desire for victory, the Pomeranians resisted out of natural treachery and self-preservation. The Poles sought glory, the Pomeranians were defending their liberty. But in the end, the Pomeranians, exhausted by their ceaseless efforts and lack of sleep, began to think that they could not resist a force of such strength. Abandoning their previous lofty pride, they surrendered themselves and their castle after receiving Boleslav's gauntlet as a pledge. But the Poles, unable to forget their many toils, their many dead, the bitter winters, the repeated treachery and ambushes, killed them to a man, sparing no one, and refusing to listen even to Boleslav when he tried to stop them. And so little by little, the rebellious and stiff-necked Pomeranians were destroyed by Boleslav, paying the rightful price for perfidy. The fortress he thought it better to retain, so he fortified it with necessities and placed his men in it. End quote. The Pomeranians were defeated once again, but you have to expect that they aren't exactly thrilled with Boleslav or the Poles. They were promised safe passage if they surrendered, and when they did surrender, according to Gallus, the Poles killed them all. There now appears to be a break in hostilities, giving everyone time to reevaluate their positions, formulate new strategies, etc. In this break, the Pomeranians and Czechs both realized they would benefit from a treaty. This Pomeranian-Bohemian alliance is interesting to analyze, since the two sides seem not to have too much in common on the surface. Sure, the Pomeranians had been quote-unquote converted and brought under Polish rule, but that was at the point of a sword. Meanwhile, the Czechs were supposedly stalwart defenders of the Holy Roman Empire. Yet they managed to overcome this difference in culture and unite around a single idea, defeating Boleslav. The terms of this agreement are unclear, but if I had to guess, the Czechs would have wanted to take back Silesia and put Zbigniew back on the throne in Poland. In return, Pomerania would also support Zbigniew due to their good relations with him, and would have wanted their historic independence returned to them. That's just speculation on my part, but it would fit with the general motives that these two groups have been operating under for decades at this point. Anyway, the summer of 1109 rolls around and the war is still on. Gallus tells us that the Pomeranians took the first steps by invading the Polish territory of Mazovia, without success. He says, quote, The Pomeranians gathered and crossed into Mazovia in search of plunder. But as they attempted to make plunder of the Mazovians, they themselves became unwilling plunder at the hands of the Mazovians. For as they ranged through Mazovia, rounding up plunder and captives and burning buildings, they stayed with their plunder unconcerned and not expecting to fight. But lo, a comis named Magnus, who was then ruling Mazovia, took a group of Mazovians small in number, but numerous in valor, and engaged the larger and innumerable force of pagans in a fearful battle. Here God revealed his omnipotence, for in the battle they say that more than 600 pagans lost their lives, and the Mazovians seized all their plunder and the captives, and that the survivors too, there can be no doubt, either were captured or fled. For Simon, the bishop of those parts, donned his priestly vestments and in company with his clerics followed his sheep who had been torn by the teeth of the wolves, mourning loudly, and strove to accomplish with spiritual arms and prayers what he was not permitted to do with material weapons. And as in ancient days the sons of Israel smote the Amalekites through the prayers of Moses, so now the Mazovians won victory over the Pomeranians with the help of their bishop's prayers. What is more, on the following day, two women picking strawberries in the woods came across a Pomeranian soldier and won a novel victory. They stripped him of his arms, bound his hands behind his back, and brought him before the Comes and the bishop. End quote. Before continuing on, I just love that anecdote Gallus puts in there about the two women picking strawberries. I was recently picking strawberries, and I just love the idea of having two women in the forest, minding their own business, bent over looking for that perfectly ripe berry beneath the leaves, and then turning to see a Pomeranian soldier. Yet, instead of trying to hide, they jumped him, stripped him, tied him up, and brought him back to the authorities. I'd hate to be that guy, but from a distance of almost a millennium, I think it's fine to laugh at his ill fortune at this point. Anywho, simultaneous to the Pomeranian entry into Poland, the Czechs had invaded from the south, with Zbigniew at the head. Gallus doesn't tell too much about this battle, except to say that, like with the Pomeranians, the Czech soldiers had been repulsed by the local inhabitants. In response to the Czech-Pomeranian alliance, Boleslav decided it was time to take a decisive blow against the Pomeranians. As Mantefel tells us, quote, The city of Nakwo, which was strategically very important in the Pomeranian line of defense along the Nocek, was surrounded by Polish troops in summer 1109. 
the city stubbornly defended itself while a very large relief column of a united Pomeranian force hurried to Nakwo. Polish detachments encountered the Pomeranians on the 10th of August, and in the decisive battle that followed, the Pomeranians were completely routed. This sealed the fate of Nakwo and six other cities, probably the entire region known as the Kraina, which were forced to capitulate. End quote. Unfortunately, despite dealing a crushing blow to the Pomeranians, it was at this moment that Boleslav received a letter from Emperor Henry V. Henry was pretty upset with Boleslav and was turning his focus on Poland. I like to imagine this moment as something like in Lord of the Rings, where everyone is just doing their own thing and all of a sudden a big fiery eye has been turned on the main characters. Will Boleslav quake in fear and submit to the Emperor's demands? Or will he try to stand his ground against the combined might of Bohemia and the Empire? We'll find out next time. In the meantime, if you're looking for some more listening, there are now two episodes on the origins of the Holy Roman Empire available to patrons on Patreon. Want to listen? Head on over to patreon.com slash historyofpolandpodcast. All are welcome. I'll see you next time. <laughs>